morning, good morning, a beautiful month, the first day of the month of February. What a beautiful blessing that the Lord has bestowed upon us. We are again now in the second month of the year 2022. An amazing year, an year of great expectations, an year of very, very many things happening at the same time. Receiving the, the blessings of God for the year 2022, the same year we have uh, two exams in the calendar of uh, our academic uh, system that we have an, uh, national exams in March and national exams in December. A year that we go to the polls to be able to elect a new president, new readers in very, very different levels. It is amazing. It's a year that is full of every manner of business. But you know what, brethren? In regardless of the many responsibilities that will be there, many expectations, many anxieties, I want to remind you, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans not to hurt you, but to give you a future that is full of hope. And I want to thank you because you have continued to follow on God's word. And I want to encourage us that we continue by God's grace to remain focused on he that says he will never leave us nor forsake us. He that promised that those who put their trust in him, they will never be put to shame. I want to remind you, regardless of whatever happens in your situations, in your environment, and whatever happens around and in our nation, one thing that we must be focused, that the Lord is our help, he is our strength, and our refuge. Seriously, a very present help for us at the times of need. And therefore, we shall not fear, even when the mountains are taken and thrown into the sea, or even when there are shakeups and there are every manner of charity, even when there are earthquakes in this country. I want to remind you, fear not, brethren, because we know who we believe, and we have faith in him, and we have trusted our future in his hands, and we are sure about it, because he has been faithful in the past, because he has proven himself in ancient times and over years, that he is a trusted and a faithful God, even now we can trust him and fear not. And therefore, may we consolidate our full trust and confidence in God because he cares for us and he is concerned about us. Having said that, the book of Colossians is the book of the month. The book of Colossians is the book of the month. And remember, remember the theme of the year. The theme of the year is in the book of Colossians chapter 2 verse 7 and I want to read to you it says looted up looted and built up in him strengthened in faith as you are taught and overflowing with thanksgiving let me bring it up again rooted and built up in him strengthened in the faith as you are taught and overflowing with thankfulness now brethren I want to remind us that now I would wish that we do an exposition of the book of Colossians, chapter 1 of the book of Colossians. Remember, a letter written by Paul while in prison, in Rome, written, given to the hand of Epaphras, the evangelist, who had started the church of Colossae. And Colossae was one of the towns, Colossians was one of the towns in Rome. And I want to remind us that it was a church of the Gentiles, mixed with the Greeks, and they were trying to find a stories. And therefore, unfortunately, this church was falling into the hands of heresy, long and false teachings. The way you see today, there is a lot of influence from everywhere, funny things, uh, teachings that the grace of God uh, is always present and therefore I can do whatever I want because the grace of God is we are born again by grace and therefore it doesn't matter what happens the grace of God will be there. And therefore, people are teaching an amazing teaching, putting it from the gospel, that I can be able to live the way I want because God's grace is always there for me. And already God has predestined pre predestinations of my life. He has predestined where I'm headed. But you know that is not the will of God because the Bible tells us that we should not take the grace of God for granted. And other teachings, amazing teachings, about putting your faith on big and uh, sometimes huge and renowned human beings as prophets. Sometimes there are waves of people mixing science and the gospel and sometimes wanting to show that rationale of thinking, like the way the times of the philosophy. 
And therefore, that is why Paul was writing to the church of Korose, just trying to collect those kind of things. And yesterday, I was able to explain in depth about why and what was happening. And that's why Paul felt that he needed to write this letter. And this is how he writes the letter. And I want just to divide this letter today in the chapter 1 into three portions. And the first portion, I want to call it the, the it is about salutation, thanksgiving, and prayer. Salutation, thanksgiving, and prayer. Verses 1 to verses 2 remind us that Paul, the apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. Number two, he goes ahead and talks about we always thank God of, for the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ and of the love you have for all God's people. I want to remind us that there is a letter written to a church that Paul had, not, had, had never had a privilege of meeting them. But he kept talking through to them through proxy through Epaphras. And now it has come a time that there is a challenge and Epaphras is seeking for help and Paul had to pen down. And by the way the letter is said, it must be written or dictated where Timothy was writing on behalf of Paul. You, you remember the pronoun uh, I in this letter reminds us is like Timothy was writing on behalf of Paul in prison. And amazingly, he is writing this letter and one of the things that he is doing here, he is telling them that one of the things that they always do is to thank God and to pray for the church. It is amazing, brethren. And I want to pick something from there. It is important to know the virtue of thanksgiving. It's amazing that Paul chooses to start this letter by salutation and also declaring, declaring how thankful he is to God about the church in Korose. You know, sometimes, by the way, I look a lot of wisdom from the reader Paul. You know, sometimes when people go along, the way we go collecting them, you know, sometimes we start with staffs of talking about the negatives and forget first to bring people closer to us. Because, you know, even Paul, in another letter, as he lights, by the way, and I know you know it, as he lights to Ephesians, he reminds us, and even the Galatians, you know, he first tells them, that it is important that if you are able to bring back a fallen brother or sister, we need to bring them forth by love. And it's amazing, I can see a lot of love here and wisdom. He first thanked God for their faith. Number two, he thanks God for the way in which they have always been concerned about their fellow brothers and sisters. This has been a family church. It's amazing that one of our philosophy in the, in the in Menengai Parish and St. Christopher, we always say that we are family church where thanksgiving is a lifestyle. It is amazing that the church of Korose had that philosophy and Paul is telling the church of Korose, we have heard about your faith and we have heard about your commitment to faith. But we have also heard how you care about your brothers and sisters. And Paul says, though I've been away and I've never met you, but we have continually prayed for you. And you know how the prayers are? He is saying that they have always prayed that love may abide. And that also that the true message that they heard of the gospel may be solidified and grounded in their lives. Can you listen to this verse 6? That he has come to you in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. Just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. It is amazing that he is also talking about a church that has not only had the gospel, but the church has proven to be fruitful and have been able to bring many on board. It's very encouraging to realize about the work of evangelist Epaphras, that he had the gospel at Ephesus, went down to his home village, started a church, and the church also was able to pull men and women together, and it was growing and it was fruitful. And by the way, we should always ask ourselves, are we true evangelists? Are we men and women that are good ambassadors for God wherever we are? This morning, my brother and sister, God has given you a platform. Maybe in your place of work. Maybe you are a teacher of a school. 
Maybe you are a manager in an institution. Maybe you are a business person in your kibanda or even in a supermarket or even you are doing any kind of business. Maybe God has given you the grace to do business with small farmers. God has given you an opportunity to be a doctor or a nurse. God has given you an opportunity to be a minister of the gospel as I am. The quick, quick question is, how good and well are we taking advantage about the platform that the Lord has given to us that we may be able to reach out? Because it's a great lesson here of Epaphras, just an evangelist who heard the gospel from Paul, but he has been able even to build and even to launch a church in Korose. And the church has grown. And even the stories and the testimony about the church are amazing testimonies. Allow me also to mention that he goes ahead as he talks about thanksgiving. He talks about something that is very, very important that I want to talk about. And verses, uh, verses 10 he says, So that you may live a life worth of the Lord and praise him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, glowing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his uh, glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his sons and he loves, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of our sins. Now, as I come to a conclusion this morning, I want to remind us about the importance that Paul is reminding the church. He is reminding the church that for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. And this is their prayer for them. That one, they may be full of wisdom and understanding of the word of God. You know what Paul now is doing? After he has been able to appreciate the church, He's now getting with a lot of wisdom to the challenge of the church. Because now he is saying that one of the things that their prayers is that they may be deeply open to, to the understanding of the truth of redemption, of salvation. That salvation, it is not by works. Like the guys around them that were rigoristic, saying that one thing that you need to do is to fulfill the law and all this stuff. He also goes ahead and he says that one of the things that also they are supposed to is to understand that God the Father qualifies us to share the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Who qualifies? It is not knowledge. As Gnosticism tried to teach, it is not about keeping away from the physical world because we have to belong and to be here. We are not of the world, though we are in the world, yes. Because we cannot, and that's why Jesus said, I'm not praying that you remove these people in the book of John chapter 17. I'm not praying that you remove these people from the world, but keep them. In other words, there is no way we can learn away and believe and behave in a ascetic way. We must remain in the world. Because that's why our brothers and sisters are, who we need also to win from the kingdom of darkness to the marvelous light of the gospel of life and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And therefore, for that reason, he now gets now deeper that salvation is not by knowledge. Salvation is not by ascetism. Salvation is not by legalism. It's not about uh, following the one who qualifies men and women for redemption. It's God himself through his son, Jesus Christ. And therefore, my brother and sister, I want to remind us that as I come to a cross, May that true understanding of the gospel, that salvation is not by any other means. Salvation is by the grace of God. Salvation is by understanding that is Jesus who died for all of us, who is our Redeemer. And finally, we are not kept by rigorism. We are kept and preserved by the grace of God that is truly founded in Christ Jesus, who is our author and the finisher of our faith. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you even this day as we continue to follow and to seek to understand the truth and the light, wisdom, and understanding of the gospel of Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.